ladies and gentlemen, Intel Arc. Alright guys, Dominic here for KitGuru and today we are checking out Intel's new ARC A750 and A770 graphics cards. Excluding the A380 which is still only available in China, these two GPUs are Intel's first release to the Western market. With the A750 landing at $289 and the 8GB version of the A770 for $329 while the 16GB version comes in at $349, there is a lot of hope that Intel can break up the AMD NVIDIA duopoly, especially with the low to mid range feeling increasingly neglected over recent years. Well, today we're going to put these two cards through their paces and tell you everything you need to know about the performance on offer as well as the driver situation. First off though, we're going to do a quick spec recap so you know exactly what it is we are looking at. Like I said, we've got the A750 and the A770, which are Intel's two highest-end ARC GPUs built on the Alchemist architecture. They're both very similar in terms of the overall core design, as they are both using Intel's ACM G10 silicon, but the A750 is shaved down in a few key areas. Primarily, it has 28 XE cores compared to 32 XE cores for the A770. Each XE core houses 16 vector engines, each vector engine with 8 FP32 ALUs, meaning the A750 offers 3,584 with 4,096 FP32 ALUs for the A770. Each XE core is accompanied by a ray tracing unit, so there's 28 for the A750 and 32 for the A770. A 256-bit memory interface is also used for both GPUs, though do note that the A750's GDR6 memory is clocked a little bit slower at 16 gigabits per second compared to 17.5 gigabits per second for the A770. Both GPUs, however, do share the same 225 watt total board power rating, something we will examine closely in this review. One thing I did also want to clarify is the exact situation on pricing and the so-called limited editions. So the cards I have here have come directly from Intel. These are the A750 and A770 limited editions. But honestly, I think that name is potentially not the best as really the best way to think about these is the equivalent to say a founder's edition. In other words, boards that Intel has manufactured themselves and will be selling directly to consumers. The only other thing to note is that for the A770, while it is available in eight or 16 gigabyte models from Intel's partners, the limited edition is 16 gigabytes only and that is the card we have here. As for pricing, the A750 was announced at $289, while the A770 starts at $329, but that is for the 8GB SKU, so the 16GB limited edition we have here is priced at $349. Intel is very clear with us that these cards will be available at those price points, so if they aren't, we will definitely give them a fair bit of stick. Getting into the test setup then, I have been hard at work over the last week testing a wide variety of comparison cards using the latest drivers. In this video we are going to be focusing on the 1080p and 1440p results which are most relevant but I did also test at 4k so if you want to see those benchmarks and every single one of our charts head over to the written review on kitguru.net. We are of course also using our 2022 GPU test rig and this is powered by MSI. This packs in an Intel i9-12900K paired with the MSI Meg Z690 Unify motherboard and 32GB of a Data XPG Lancer DDR5 memory clocked at 6000MHz. 
We're also using the 4K MSI MPG321 URQD monitor for all of our testing. Resizable bar or rebar is enabled for all GPUs tested, which is something we've started doing since the beginning of the year. However, there is a bit more to say on this for the Intel Arc GPU, so I will be taking a closer look at rebar performance later in this video. With that all out the way though, let's roll the benchmarks. Kicking things off then with Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Performance is relatively decent for both Arc GPUs in this title. The A750 averages 66 FPS at 1080p compared to 72 FPS for the A770, so that's not a massive delta between the two, but both are faster than the RTX 3060, though the RX 6600 is faster still. At 1440p now, both ARC cards are able to overtake the RX 6600, but the A750 is still basically neck and neck with the 3060 and the 6600. The A770, meanwhile, is 5% slower than the RX 6600 XT, though do keep in mind this is an AMD-sponsored title. Next up is going to be Cyberpunk 2077, and this is the start of many driver issues that we experienced. For reasons unknown, the A750 and A770 just produced terrible 1% lows in the open world of Night City. So while average frame rates aren't actually too far off the RTX 3060, the overall experience was just very choppy. As you can see from this frame time graph, with the frame time simply all over the place. We can also note basically no performance advantage for the A770 over the A750. Weirdly though, the frame times are a bit better at 1440p, relatively speaking that is, and both cards now produce a higher average frame rate than the RTX 3060, though with ultra settings in this game at 1440p, it really is still too much for this caliber of GPU to handle and the 1% lows do dip below 30 FPS. Funnily enough, I experienced exactly the same frame time issue in Days Gone. For whatever reason, the 1% lows are just awful on Arc, and it really is a borderline unplayable experience in my opinion, even though the average frame rates are relatively decent. The weird thing is, as soon as I stepped up to 1440p, the frame times improved dramatically, which I just don't get and we're going to have to put it down to some driver shenanigans. Of course, Days Gone is a DX11 title, which is much more of a challenge for the Arc GPUs, and Intel also tells us that the Arc cards do scale at higher resolutions, but even so, check out this frame time graph comparing 1080p to 1440p performance on the A750. Now, admittedly, the 1440p frame times are still not great, but they are grouped a heck of a lot closer together than what we see at 1080p. Moving on though, we come on to Dying Light 2, and at last we have a solid victory for the Arc GPUs. At 1080p, the A750 is actually 13% faster than the RTX 3060, while the A770 is 17% faster than the 6600 XT, and actually only just behind the 3060 Ti, so both models are doing very well here. At 1440p, the Arc GPU scale even better, and now the A770 is basically matching the 3060 Ti, averaging just under 70 FPS, which is no mean feat. The A750 is also well clear of the RTX 3060, delivering 19% better performance. Far Cry 6 then is not as impressive, but performance is still decent. At 1080p, the A750 averages 91 FPS, making it a little bit slower than the RX 6600, but not by much. The A770 is also basically matching the 6600, delivering 97 FPS on average. Once more, at 1440p, both Arc GPUs do tend to do a bit better. This time the A770 is matching the 6600 XT, while the A750 is now 5% faster than the RX 6600. As for Forza Horizon 5, this is another strong title for the Arc GPUs, with the A770 only trailing the 3060 Ti by 4 frames per second at 1080p. Now, using the extreme preset in this game is particularly VRAM hungry, 
And I believe that really does help the A770 shine here, even against the A750, where it's actually 15% faster, the biggest margin that we will see between those two cars today at 1080p. That trend is also exacerbated at 1440p, where the A750 really does drop off a bit harder, and now the A770 is 28% faster than its smaller brother. It just goes to show that there are at least some games where having more than 8GB of VRAM is preferable. Up next is God of War, and despite the game's menu being incredibly sluggish and glitchy, actual in-game performance isn't too bad for a DX11 title. It's obviously not as impressive as some of the other DX12 games that we've tested, with the A750 barely outperforming the RTX 2060, but it is still playable. The ARC GPUs also do better, relatively speaking that is, at 1440p, with the A750 now matching the RTX 3060. There's only 3 FPS difference between the A750 and the A770 though, so it's not a great deal of scaling on offer. Next on the list is Horizon Zero Dawn, another DX12 title and performance is a lot stronger here. At 1080p, the A770 is just about edging the 6600 XT by 4%, while the A750 is 6% slower than that AMD GPU, while also matching the RTX 3060. At 1440p, the 6600 XT does drop away a bit, and the A770 is now 11% faster, with the A750 matching it and the RTX 3060 almost exactly. We would now be moving on to check out Marvel's Spider-Man Remastered, but unfortunately, the lighting is pretty broken on Arc GPUs, as you can see here. Enabling ray tracing did also result in a hard crash every single time, though admittedly, Intel did push out another driver during the review process to fix that, though I'm not really sure what good enabling ray tracing is going to do, when the lighting is as broken as it is. Instead, we're going to move on to Red Dead Redemption 2 in DX12, and this game is easily the best case scenario for an ARC GPU. At 1080p, the A770 is a match for the RTX 3060 Ti, averaging 80 FPS at max settings, while the A750 is a couple percent faster than the RX 6600 XT, something we've not seen much of today. At 1440p as well, the A750 is even able to stretch its lead over the 6600 XT, now coming in 7% faster, while the A770 is actually 15% ahead of the 6600 XT, which is not bad at all. As for Resident Evil Village, at 1080p, the A750 hits 144 FPS on average, slotting it neatly between the 6600 and the 6600 XT, while we can also see that the A770 is a match for the 6600 XT, averaging just shy of 160 FPS. At 1440p as well, the A770 manages to outpace the 6600 XT by a couple of frames, while the A750 is only 7% slower. Either way, hitting over 100 FPS at this resolution makes for a very smooth gaming experience. The last game on the list then would be Total War Warhammer 3, but unfortunately that title looks a little something like this, so it's definitely not playable. Arguably more concerning is the fact that Intel thought they'd actually fixed this issue on a prior driver version, but that obviously isn't the case, so... As it is, Warhammer 3 is just not going to work on an ARC GPU. With that last game then bringing us back on to the driver conversation, I wanted to take a closer look at DX11 performance. While this is far from an exhaustive list, I benchmarked an extra 5 games that offer support for both DX11 and either DX12 or Vulkan. Intel is admittedly at least honest with us that the DX11 performance is not going to be nearly as good simply because that puts a lot more emphasis on the driver than a low level API would, but we're going to put that to the test with the A750 at 1080p resolution. Looking at the benchmarks then, what I honestly find to be absolutely hilarious is the very first game I tested being Battlefield 5. 
actually had such bad frame times using DX12 that even though the average frame rate is 35% worse in DX11, you actually get a better experience overall from that API. It really does just go to show that DX12 is not guaranteed to run well on Arc, as we've already seen from the Cyberpunk frame times as well. It's also worth mentioning that I initially wanted to test Kenya Bridge of Spirits in this section as well, but while the DX11 mode of that game would run admittedly fairly slowly, opting into the DX12 mode would result in a B-Sod several times, so make of that what you will. Generally though, the DX11 performance is a huge step down compared to either DX12 or Vulkan. Some games, like Control for instance, do see smaller reductions to the average frame rates, but a big hit to the 1% lows, while other games, including Rainbow Six Siege, just get way worse across the board. In the words of Intel's Tom Peterson, optimizing Arc for DX11 titles is a task that's going to take forever, but there's no way around it. Right now, this is a massive red flag. On a similar topic, we do also need to talk about resizable bar, also known as rebar. Now, I've already mentioned that we do test with rebar enabled for all compatible GPUs, something we've started doing since the beginning of the year. But again, credit to Intel, they are at least very honest about this. And I think Intel's Tom Peterson actually told us straight up that if your system doesn't support resizable bar, just go and buy an RTX 3060. So, I think that probably tells you everything you need to know, but we're gonna dive into the data a little bit closer. Having tested four games then with rebar on and with rebar off, we can absolutely see why Tom Peterson made that statement. Performance frankly dropped like a rock across the board, with the 1% lows almost cut in half in Assassin's Creed Valhalla, and need we even mention the Forza Horizon 5 performance, which was literally unplayable without rebar, even at 1080p. Clearly then, if your system doesn't support rebar, I think you can just straight up forget Intel Arc. Although for me, this isn't as big of an issue as the DX11 performance is. As we will get to later on in the video as well, I don't think there's gonna be many people who aren't enthusiasts who will be buying Intel Arc just yet. So chances are, if you do buy an Arc GPU, you probably already have a rebar system. But if you don't, I really don't think that Arc is ready for the mainstream just yet, if resizable bar is not an option. Let's have some good news though, something we're probably overdue on, and that comes when looking at ray tracing. For Intel's first discrete GPU launch, I have to say the ray tracing performance on offer is pretty impressive. Starting off with Cyberpunk at 1080p, even though the frame rates are pretty low across the board, the A770 is neck and neck with the RTX 3060 with ray tracing set to ultra, and the A750 isn't too far behind either. Even in Metro Exodus Enhanced Edition, which uses a ton of ray trace lighting, the A770 is actually outperforming the RTX 3060 Ti by admittedly a tiny margin, but this is a lot better than I thought it would be. Now, I did also want to test ray tracing in Marvel's Spider-Man Remastered, but we've already seen how broken that is, so quickly moving on to our last game, which is Resident Evil Village. Here, it's another strong showing with ray tracing set to high, as the A750 comes in just shy of the RTX 3060, while the A770 is even six FPS ahead of its NVIDIA base rival. It's at this part of the video then where I usually show a performance summary presenting the average frame rate from across all 12 games, allowing us to compare these GPUs against the competition. However, I won't be doing that for Intel Arc, at least not yet. For starters, two of the 12 games I tested are visually broken, so there's that. But more fundamentally, I don't think you can actually kind of boil down the experience of using Intel Arc into a single chart. For myself personally, I wouldn't want to do that and present a single graph. Somebody sees it and maybe thinks, oh, the RTX 3060 
is a little bit slower than the a750 because for me that really doesn't show the whole picture and could be quite misleading in my experience the actual gaming experience of using intel arc can vary massively from game to game so that's why i didn't want to boil things down into a single chart with that said though we're going to move on to look at the cards themselves before assessing things like thermals acoustics and power draw We've already got some positive reaction about the design of Intel's limited edition cards, and I have to say they are very sleek, being just two slots thick and a standard length of 266.7mm. They're almost entirely black as well, with two 90mm fans that blow down onto a copper vapor chamber and aluminium fin stack. Admittedly, the backplate is made from plastic, but we still can't deny it definitely looks the part. Both cards are almost identical in their design, the only difference being the A770 offers several RGB lighting zones that are missing from the A750. This is also customizable for the A770 if you connect the GPU to your motherboard with an included USB cable, though the control app does look and feel very clunky. Both cards also require an 8-pin and 6-pin power connector, but Intel take a bow for including three DisplayPort 2.0 connectors and one HDMI 2.1, something we've frankly been waiting ages for. Looking at the thermal performance then, we ran the cards for a 30-minute stress test at Cyberpunk at 4K, and honestly, the results are absolutely fine. Note that we are looking at GPU and VRAM temperatures here, but both the A750 and A770 kept the GPU temperature at around 70 degrees Celsius. Now, the VRAM on the A750 did run a bit hotter at 80 degrees, but for such relatively compact cards, we really can't complain at all. Moving on to noise levels then, it's not really a surprise to see the A770 does run a bit louder, after all, it is using the same cooler design as the A750, but on a faster running chip. Still, with fan speed at around 1800 RPM, the noise really wasn't too bad, hitting 38 decibels, while the A750 ran the fans at about 1600 RPM, hitting 36 decibels, which is roughly equivalent to the RTX 2060 Founders Edition, so it's overall very easy on the ears. I do have to say though that coil wine is a bit of a problem for these limited edition cards. Not so much while actually gaming, but certainly in some menus where there's uncapped frame rates, you can definitely hear some fairly loud squealing, but take a listen for yourself. Moving on to total system power draw then, here we can see with the A770 installed, our test rig drew 374 watts at the wall, which was a little bit less than with the RTX 3070. Despite having the same board power rating, the A750 did in fact draw a little bit less juice at 349 watts, so about a 25 watt difference between the A750 and the A770. We do also have more granular figures to look at, this time assessing only power draw of the graphics card only, which is done using NVIDIA's PCAT tool. The scaling we can see here does closely match what we saw from the total system power draw, but we can see the A770 is pulling about 225 watts at 1440p, with the A750 coming in just shy of 200 watts total board power. Power draw of those sorts of levels, however, does mean that the Intel Arc GPUs aren't particularly efficient given the performance on offer. Even in the absolute best case scenario, being Red Dead Redemption 2 at 1440p, performance per watt is middling, but still significantly below the likes of the 6600 and 6600 XT. In a worst case scenario though, as we see in God of War, Performance per watt is actually worse than the Turing-based RTX 2060. 
It's probably low down on the list of concerns for Intel Arc, but a new efficiency champion, this is not. Lastly then, we will briefly touch on overclocking using Intel's Arc Control software. Being completely honest, I have to say I thought this would be an absolute shambles, but it was actually surprisingly painless. The Arc Control software itself is still missing a fair few features, there's not even an option for fan control yet. It also spawns multiple instances of the Control Assist software, and the fact it's an overlay that you just can't resize is pretty frustrating. But in terms of actual overclocking, we did fairly well. For both cards, we maximized the power limit, and then for the A750, we increased the voltage offset by 90 millivolts and set the performance boost up to 27. For the A770, we increased the voltage offset by 60 millivolts and the performance boost up to 16. This saw the time spy scores improve for both GPUs by a 10% margin. And we can also see a 9% boost for the A750 in Resident Evil Village, compared to a 7% bump for the A770. Power draw did rise significantly, of course, with both cards now drawing about 280 watts, further reducing the overall efficiency, but there is at least some overclocking headroom. So, there we have it. That's been our look at the Intel Arc A750 and A770 graphics cards, and it's been quite a ride. Being completely honest, I really didn't have a clue what to expect when both of these graphics cards turned up on my doorstep, but safe to say we have got the picture. And in all honesty, I think that picture is pretty clear. In my opinion, these GPUs are just not ready yet. Now, I'm not talking about the hardware here, as we've definitely seen some positive glimpses, but in my view, the software really is what's holding these GPUs back from earning any kind of recommendation. I'm talking about things like incredibly erratic frame times, crashes, b-sods, visual glitches, not even to mention the fact that DX11 performance is awful and resizable bar is basically a must for Intel Arc GPUs. I'd also add to that by saying, you know, I've not actually gone out of my way to find problems. I simply sat down and tried to benchmark a bunch of different games and this has been my experience. Like I said though, there is definitely promise here, and don't get me wrong, I really don't want to turn this into an Intel bashing exercise. There is definitely promise here. As we saw, Ark really does fly in certain games like Red Dead Redemption 2 and Dying Light 2, where it's far better than the likes of the RTX 3060. For a first generation DGPU architecture as well, ray tracing performance is really, really solid and was taking the fight and even beating the likes of the RTX 3060 and even the RTX 3060 Ti in Metro Exodus Enhanced Edition. Still, for all the talk of promise and the fact we do have to give Intel a bit of leeway as it's their first DGPU launch, at the end of the day, a company has come to market with a product and now wants your money for it. Based on that, I just can't recommend going out and buying Intel Arc based on my experiences. Maybe if something like the A750 was $199, then you might, might consider taking a pretty big gamble on it, but for me, with pricing as it is, especially considering the fact that the 6650 XT really isn't that much more expensive. At the moment, I just can't recommend to anyone who doesn't want a stressful, frustrating experience to go out and buy Intel Arc. Of course though, we're really hoping that things will change. This is after all just the beginning for Intel Arc, and you can bet that we're gonna bring you updates down the line, hopefully as the drivers mature, and the picture changes. For now though guys, that has been my review of the Intel A750 and A770 graphics cards. If you liked it, please do drop me a thumbs up and as always, let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. I'd really love to hear from you guys about these two GPUs. Please do hit that subscribe button and ding that notification bell if you haven't already. And why not come chat with us on our Discord server, which is linked in the description below. 
While there, you can also find a link to our merch store, and if you're feeling particularly generous, you could even consider backing us on Patreon. That's it for this one though, guys. I'm Dominic Forkit Guru, and I'll see you in the next video.